hi everyone. My pleasure to introduce today's CPM seminar speaker, Professor Uribe. So Professor Uribe completed his master's degree at Simon Fraser University, his, his PhD at the University of Calgary, in which he had multiple research positions, including uh, a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Waterloo, and he was a postdoctoral researcher and a researcher for Microsoft Research, also a physicist and an affiliate professor at Pacific Northwest National Labs, and he is currently a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. And today we will have the opportunity to learn about his work on simulating harmonic oscillators using quantum computers. So we don't have to Wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. I, I always love any excuse that I can get to come out to Montreal. And uh, it's wonderful that this is actually, or tragic, depending on your perspective, that this is my uh, uh, first uh, uh, trip out to McGill. But at least I'm really grateful that the federal government didn't make me, or sorry, provincial government didn't make me learn French for this visit. But um, <laughs> probably that's a little too close to home for folks. Um, but in any case, today I'm going to be talking to you about probably what I feel is the most fun project I've ever done in my life. This work came about because of a really, a really awesome research experience where what happened is me and the rest of my colleagues listed below, we were able to actually just take some time off. So we all flew down to Australia uh, to just spend a week doing nothing but research. So we blew off all of our students, blew off all of our meetings. Oh, wait, maybe I should say that my students listening. Uh, but in any case, I carefully read all of my students' emails and responded to their meaningful requests while um, working on this in, in Australia. And so the reason why we were, were interested in this question came about because of this, the following sort of weird observation that we had. And there are this, I, uh, this observation came from this question, right? What are quantum computers really actually good for at the end of the day? Quantum computers ideally can provide you with exponential speed ups for certain computational tasks. Note the most famous examples are uh, simulation of physical systems, uh, such as you know, chemistry, matters, and uh, some condensed matter simulation, uh, as well as certain quantum field theories to be simulated exponentially faster than what a classical computer could do. Uh, modulo reasonable complexity theoretic assumptions, blah, 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 blah. So the um, point is that we still actually don't really know how far beyond that and cryptography applications the power of quantum computers end up stretching. One of the things that was realized just a few years ago is that quantum computers can actually provide, in theory, exponential advantage for solving systems of differential equations. And differential equations that need not necessarily even be unitary. And so the question that came up is, wow, all right, this seems like it's a really awesome power. What could we actually use a quantum computer uh, to solve uh, practically and get an exponential advantage? It turned out when we started trying to tear apart this question in order to be able to find a good example of an exponential speed up for solving um, differential equations, every single case that we came up with uh, but one ended up immediately falling apart at uh, first inspection. Can anybody here guess what's the example of the differential equation that we were able to find that a quantum computer could provably provide an exponential advantage for? Any guesses? Schrodinger. Schrodinger equation, exactly. The dumbest thing you could possibly think of. And so this begged the question, what was it about these problems that caused every single other equation that we were looking at to resist our attempts in order to be able to find a provable exponential speed up for being able to deal with this. And actually, that's where this came about. This was our first success, where we were able to find a example of a family of differential equations where quantum computers can provably end up giving a exponential speed up. Now, this is by far the strangest example 
you could, I think, could say, uh, yeah, think of for getting an exponential advantage. Because, well, okay, I, pro I would need to explain this a lot more, I think, you know, to the uh, CS folks that up at my department. But for physicists, I think every physicist has been trained, you know, in the, our contemporary system knows that everything around them is a harmonic oscillator, but maybe with some small perturbations, but whatever. It's all deep, deep down. Everything can basically be modeled as a harmonic oscillator. And it's and also harmonic oscillators are the most classical systems that we can think of, especially classical harmonic oscillators. And yet, uh, strangely, it seems that quantum can provide an exponential advantage for simulating these systems that ostensibly, at first glance, look like they have nothing to do with quantum theory and are about as far from it as possible. So that's the thing that's fascinating. The next thing that we ended up finding, and the question you might ask is, well, why was it that we can be so confident that quantum computers genuinely provide an exponential advantage? Because it's one thing to say, OK, well, I can solve this problem exponentially faster than, say, I don't know, running a kind of methods could it when uh, be applying the brute force to this. It's another thing to say they're exponentially faster than any conceivable algorithm that you could end up building to solve this problem. Mind below some realistic assumptions. The reason why we're able to show that so we actually showed that you can build a quantum computer out of classical harmonic oscillators. And the only way that actually our algorithm's performance could be tied is if quantum had no more computational power than classical, which we, for a number of reasons, strongly don't believe is true. So that's the thing that's actually really shocking, I feel, about this work. And if you take nothing uh, more home uh, from this talk, uh, than this, and this is what I would focus on. It's that classical harmonic oscillators actually are deeply hiding some quantum-like features, and in fact, so much so that you can embed an entire quantum computation in an exponentially large number of uh, classical harmonic oscillators. And so that's how our work uh, ends up going. So. Um, I guess I got slides that ends up explaining all of this, but yeah, I'd love to open it up for questions. Why is it surprising that you can use an exponentially large number of classical degrees of freedom to describe a quantum computation? Because we know we can describe the wave function in exponentially large right. over space with exponentially large number of complex parameters. Yeah, exactly. So it sounded like you were saying that's a surprising. To me, it was a huge surprise. I mean, the fact that it would be an even bigger supply of surprise, I'm probably wrong. If I said I could do a polynomially large number of harmonic oscillators. But still, even having an exponentially large vector space doesn't necessarily mean that you can capture um, a capture. For example, my, my favorite thing is a uh, favorite example to show this is let's imagine that we had a system that was the following we have 100 coins here. And we want, would like to be able to describe the probability distribution that we would get out of flipping the 100 coins. In order to describe every possible probability distribution that we could get for these 100 coins that have nothing to do with quantum, their dimension here is a dimension 2 to the 100. So simply matching the dimension of the Hilbert space, oh, OK, in this case, it's a Bonnet space, technically. but. Met, uh, matching the uh, dimension of the vector spaces that end up describing it isn't sufficient in order to be able to match the power. Because obviously, with classical probability distributions, there are some things that we just can't do that quantum can end up doing. So the question, the really interesting thing about it isn't the dimension of the space, really, because probabilistic methods would conceivably be able to tie that. The thing that's interesting about it is that we're able to actually jury rig the mechanical interference that we end up having for these systems to end up exactly emulating the quantum mechanical interference that we would end up getting through um, ordinary unitary evolution. That, to me, was the part that surprised me. But also, I said it in a way that you know uh, captured our intuition in retrospect that we ended up getting after we ended up seeing the result. Our path towards the result, obviously, is much more circuitous as science ends up uh, often being. Any other questions about this? 
No? All right. Well, I'll get I'll get on with the getting on. So basically, all right, the high level story, which I'm sure almost everybody in here is uh, familiar with, is quantum quantum dynamics, which is the thing that we're uh, that we're all that all, quantum computers can ultimately end up emulating, is described by uh, unitary evolution, which is given by e to the minus i h g, where h is uh, the system Hamiltonian, which is you know a generic, which is a Hermitian matrix, and in general these matrices are exponentially large in the number of quantum degrees of freedom that you've got. So if we've got 100 interacting spins, the dimension for this thing would be like dimension 2 to the 100. And this is one of the things that makes quantum dynamics, in practice, extremely difficult to simulate using uh, determi uh, deterministic methods. So the basic idea behind it is that what we would like to be able to do in general, if we're thinking about Hamiltonian simulation and, and or in um, simulate a simulating differential equations and things like this is we'd like to take the natural dynamics of a physical system and be able to translate that into a sequence of instructions that we can end up running on a quantum computer. So the diagram that I really like to be able to describe how this process of getting quantum computers to simulate dynamics like we're ultimately going to do with the harmonic oscillator is the following. Simulation takes place in two worlds. Some might even argue there's actually a third world, but um, let's, let's ignore that. So for the moment, we've got two worlds. We've got the, the physical system that we would like to simulate. And that gives us the mathematical model that describes the uh, dynamics that we would like the quantum computer to emulate. Then we've got the space of the quantum computer. Now, I've drawn these boxes to represent two different dimensions of Hilbert spaces, and it's no coincidence that the quantum computer's box is bigger than the classical computer's box. The reason why is that what we, uh, what we require with the quantum computer simulation is we require that basically every state in the physical system ends up being uniquely mapped to a particular uh, state in the Hilbert space of the quantum computer. But we don't require that every state in the Hilbert space of the quantum computer uh, correspond to a state in the physical system. And the reason why is we might have extra memory, we might have other things in our simulation that would make it actually not possible to have a, um, a kind of a bijective map between the two. So what we need to do is we need to have an encoding over here that takes our initial state that we would like to evolve and that maps it to a state in the Hilbert space. Then we have our dynamics that's given by e to the minus i h t that takes our initial state to a final state. And we'd like to break this up into a series of gate operations in our quantum computer, such that that initial state is brought through some circuitous path to a final state in the quantum computer's Hilbert space, such that that final state is logically equivalent to a state that we would see in the physical system that's provably a distance epsilon away from our target. And our goal here is to minimize the number of these uh, gate operations that we need to carry out in order to be able to get epsilon close to our target for some epsilon greater than zero and some simulation time t. So that's what uh, people, uh, primarily computer scientists, will end up calling the Hamiltonian simulation problem. Uh, and I just want to be clear about that because Obviously, to many people, Hamiltonian simulation ends up meaning finding the ground state. If I end up using that term in this, uh, this talk, I, it'll be actually re referencing this dynamical simulation problem that we end up using. But if anybody gets confused about that, please bother me. Unfortunately, the term is overloaded. Yes? I'm just a bit confused because you referred to the physical system as classical, but obviously you're doing quantum dynamics. Well, here, actually, sorry, I, the physical system here is actually a quantum system that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. The trick is for the overall uh, discussion of the, uh, or the overall uh, spoiler alert for the, the talk, is that we're going to show that the harmonic oscillator can be mapped to an equivalent quantum system. Mm -hmm. And then we'll use the exact same uh, transformation to carry through. Any other questions? Rad. Oh, and the third world that I wanted to talk about, which is, I, I shouldn't, but my experimental colleagues tell me something important that we should consider, would be the real system. 
which of course is not going to necessarily have the, the same features as, as our mathematical model that we're simulating. But for the moment, let's just assume that the real real world is just a first order approximation to the, to the mathematics. So um, cool, that is uh, what we end up meeting. Now, just to give an idea about where, where we're at, for those of you who don't do quantum simulation for a living, there's a number of different methods that have been proposed uh, for doing these simulations. Basically, what we need to do is we need to just come up with some set of uh, techniques to decompose our evolution into a sequence of things that we know how to deal with. These decomposition techniques end up following a bunch of different strategies, including uh, Trotter-Suzuki decompositions, which are the first ones. And these techniques basically end up saying, if your Hamiltonian is equal to H0 plus H1, and you are able to figure out a way of simulating H0 or H1 independently, then for a sufficiently short time, we can do make an approximation that this is going to be H0 T e to the minus I H1 T uh, plus order T squared. And then what we do is we just build a circuit for each and every one of those terms that appears in the Trotter Suzuki composition independently. So, this is the oldest and most popular technique still for uh, doing uh, quantum simulations, but there's other approaches. There's randomized strategies that end up using, instead of deterministic decompositions like this, they'll pick ra randomly. And then there's other techniques like linear combination of unitaries, as well as quantum walk techniques that are often known under the, the moniker qubitization. But they basically all have different pros, they all have different cons. And uh, in, in our work, we're mostly going to end up talking about using this technique down here because it ends up giving us the best scaling. Ultimately, at the end of the day, irrespective of the particular method that you're uh, taking a look at, the best scaling for the number of operations that we can end up seeing ends up basically scaling like order t plus log one over epsilon, where t is the simulation time that we're, we're interested in, and uh, epsilon is the uh, error tolerance that we're looking at. Um, yeah, and so yeah, I recognize the units don't make sense because this is a physics crowd. Uh, there's complicated dependence on something that looks like the norm of the Hamiltonian coming in, but I don't want to talk about what that thing is because it's not quite the norm of the Hamiltonian. But um, that uh, the quantum walks approach, known as qubitization down at the bottom, saturates this linear time scaling that we've got at the top. And uh, for that, re which is optimal, we can't do any better than linear time scaling. So does anybody know why linear time scaling is the best that you can end up doing for uh, a quantum simulation algorithm? OK, well, let's imagine for the, uh, here's, this isn't a rigorous argument, but this is something that I, that I always love telling my students because it, it carries the essence of the absurdity of what would happen if there, you, there was a sublinear algorithm. Let's imagine that you could simulate quantum dynamics in time that went like order t to the 1 half plus log 1 over epsilon. So basically, if we've got a simulation with time t, we can simulate it using a, a, a number of gate operations that goes like square root t. OK, that's really kind of, that would be really kind of cool. But what we could do is we could also notice that a quantum computer is itself a time-dependent or a time-dependent quantum system. So if we could simulate that in time that goes like the square root of t, rather than simulating our physical system over here, instead, what we'd be better off doing is we'd be better off simulating our quantum computer that simulates this. Because if this takes time t to perform a simulation, my simulation can do this in root t time. Yes? Couldn't I imagine calculating a propagator that finds the evolution at a particular point t given some initial condition more efficiently? Um, you could, under so certain circumstances, end up doing it. But the problem of computing, say, the, a particular you know, a matrix element of the propagator is that actually that's a problem that quantum computers can do uh, uh, better than 1 over epsilon, where epsilon is the additive error that you're looking at for that. And for generic propagator, 
those, pro those quantities are going to be exponentially small. So you really can't actually get enough precision on a quantum computer to be able to end up doing that. So for some problems, we could compute exactly what you're taking a look at. But that problem would have to have a lot of special structure to allow even a quantum computer to be able to do that. So normally what we're interested in is kind of more coarse-grained uh, properties. But if we take a look at a more coarse-grained thing, like some expectation value, something like that, then I do agree with your sentiment. You, we could end up matching that. Any other questions? Cool. All right, so if we could do it in square root t time, we could just, well, why bother stopping there? Why not simulate our simulation of the simulation? So we get our, now get our quantum computer to simulate the quantum computer simulating that. Now we can do that in t to the one quarter time. And we can keep on recursing this over and over and over again until we can solve every problem using a constant number of operations, which is bonkers. So that's, that is one of the reasons why in your heart of hearts, you should believe that it's impossible to be able to simulate quantum dynamics in general for, uh, for everything faster than linear time. Of course, there exist particular cases, such as systems that we could, you can efficiently diagonalize, where you can simulate it much faster than this. But if you could simulate anything in less than linear time, then it would lead to the, this uh, uh, absurd situation where all computations can be done instantly. OK. So that's basically how this ends up going. As I said, here are some generic costs for it. And we like this simulation method because of the fact that it has uh, linear scaling for this. Now, as I said before, there's a number of different applications that people have ended up finding for quantum computers. And as I said before, you know, the, thing, the biggest question that we end up having is whether or not simulating systems of linear differential equations ends up actually giving us a quantum advantage or not. So this question, you might ask, well, why did we stumble into harmonic oscillators as our particular example? And as I, as I mentioned or alluded to in the beginning of the talk, it's kind of a really unlikely candidate for a system that exhibits an exponential advantage. And the reason why we stumbled into it was actually because of this really cool paper that Rover ended up putting out shortly after he discovered his search algorithm. And what this paper ended up um, uh, doing is showing that actually you can build a mechanical uh, implementation of Rover search. So the basic idea here is what you have in this particular case is you've got a pendulum sitting on top of a support with a set of other pendulums going, uh, going off of the bottom. And then the question is, can you identify which of the pendulums over here from the vibrational frequencies is actually going is actually the shorter of all the rest of the pendulums? And it turns out that the total you uh, by using a um, experiment that drives this with particular frequencies, you can actually probe this in a way that's mathematically equivalent to Grover's search algorithm to be able to actually find the uh, shorter pendulum in time that ends up going like the square root of the number of pendulums. So this ends up showing that actually there's a mechanical, like a classical mechanical analog of Grover search that ended up appearing because of mechanical appearance. And Grover search is an example of something that we believe ends up actually leading to um, quantum, uh, quantum light advantages. And so this led me to think, wait a second, maybe this is saying something more fundamental than Grover even realized. Maybe what this is suggesting is that there's actually a deeper connection between mechanical oscillation, like you would end up seeing for pendulums in the small angle approximation, and quantum. Because after all, a Grover light speed up is uh, something that, at least in, uh, in discrete uh, quanta, uh, classical computation, unlike the continuous model that you're seeing here, um, quantum ends up actually getting a quadratic advantage form. So that shows a separation between quantum and classical. And that led us to suspect, yeah, maybe oscillators could actually be a target. So as we start, yeah. Sorry, maybe I'm the only one, but I don't know what's the real research. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That is entirely my, my fault. So Grover's search algorithm basically 
How that ends up going is uh, the following. Um, Grover search is a way of uh, finding a item in an, uh, a, in an unmarked, uh, unsorted list of items faster than uh, what you could do classically. In the worst case scenario, if you end up having N items, like let's imagine you had like an old school phone book that was ra uh, randomly um, shuffled and you're looking for somebody's phone number in it, but if it's random, worst case scenario, you'd have to go through the entire book before you end up finding the entry again. So if you have N items in, in this classically to deterministically end up finding the outcome, we need to query that uh, at least N minus one times to be able to find the, the identity for it. If we use quantum in order to be able to do the same thing, then we can search N in time that goes like order root N over here. And the basic intuition behind it, it, it can be seen in the, the following. What we do is we carry out a pair of reflections in Hilbert space in order to be able to um, boost the probability of us randomly guessing the right answer. So as an example, what we do is for Grover search, we can think about space here where this is the marked, this is a vector corresponding to the marked element that we'd like to learn. This is some orthogonal vector to the thing that we'd like to find. And let's imagine that this over here is our initial state, psi i I'm calling it. Now, what we do is we carry out a series of uh, reflections over here. If this angle is theta, first thing that we do is we reflect about m perpendicular inside this two-dimensional space using a simple, simple uh, reflection circuit. Once we do that, then this initial vector psi i will be reflected down here. Then what we do is we build a quantum circuit that reflects about psi i, which will, from geometry, carry us up to an angle here, which would be an angle now 2 theta from where we were before. So in general, if we take a look at after every time we do this, we increase our rotation angle by 2 theta. So the probability of us guessing m at the top from our state, every time we do this, I'll call this uh, p sub m of j, this will be equal to sine squared, just from geometry, uh, 2j plus 1 theta over here. OK? So if we end up uh, picking j such that 2j plus 1 is approximately equal to pi by 2, then we'll have boosted the success probability to 100%. The question is, how does the success probability grow as a function of the number of iterations? Well, it goes like sine squared. So if we just do a Taylor series expansion, we see that pm of j ends up scaling like j squared theta squared. So we can see that we get quadratically more bang for our buck just because of Born's rule for this. We get you know, j squared uh, a rotation angle for j iterations as opposed to just linear. And that's what gives us this quadratic separation that we have between quantum and classical for the search. So the funny thing is that it's entirely dependent upon the normalization of quantum mechanics. If God had just come down and said, you know what? This whole second power thing sounds really boring. Let me do fourth power normalization for the, the state, uh, state vector. Then we get a fourth root speed up here. The best would be the infinity, uh, the infinity of power separation. Then this would be instant. But sadly, we don't live in such a universe. Any, any questions about Grover or this? Yes. Sorry, it's been a while since I thought about this. So, any question? Um, so, this hinges upon the fact that we have a circuit that kind of knows and can kind of mm -hmm. reflect on it. But it's an oracle, and just by looking at the machine, we don't know it. Yeah, so this is all in an oracular setting. So, what we need to do is we need to have a divide. We need to have a, a circuit that we can build in the quantum computer that can check to see if it's found the thing you're looking for. Okay, so this is some, in the language of computer science, this is most naturally phrased for problems that are in the class NP, where there exists an easy uh, circuit that you can build to verify that you got the right answer, but it might be really hard for you to be able to find it. So while people talk about this all the time in the context of un unstructured database search, it's actually like the shittiest possible example. 
of this algorithm that you could think of. Because somehow you'd have to load your database in. You would have had to have actually seen that thing you're looking for. You might have even been able to sort it along the way. So that application is really, it doesn't really make too much sense. But in cases where you're trying to solve a um, NP hard problem, then that, that, that this setting is exactly perfect. Like for example, before, you know, if we hadn't, if we didn't know about Shor's algorithm, we could factor numbers and get a quadratic speed up by uh, with this, just by trying to randomly guess factors for this and then using this to boost the amplitude. Any other questions? Cool. All right. So that's the that that's the basic idea behind uh, behind this. Now let's move on to harmonic oscillator and argue why there's actually perhaps a better connection with the, between the harmonic oscillator and quantum than we might think. So in particular, let's just assume that we've got the following uh, classical uh, Hamiltonian that uh, ends up describing a system of coupled harmonic oscillators. We basically just got a bunch of kinetic energies and a bunch of potential energies. Here, these represent kind of interactions with a wall. This is the position of J mass. And these are the interactions between them. This, of course, is the kinetic energy of the system. Then, you know, we all, we, uh, as we all know and love, you know, the force can be found by uh, dv, uh, negative dv by dx. And so we end up getting that, those dynamics coming back out of it. And this effectively is the differential equation that we'd like to solve. OK, cool. Still doesn't look very quantum. But let's take a look at this, this guy in phase space. In phase space, if we, we start drawing this in terms of x and p, does this look like something that, uh, that you end up seeing in quantum? Yeah, what does it look like? It's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's how you know you're talking. That's how you know you're talking to a bunch of physicists when they say, oh yeah, that clearly looks like the expectation value of the dynamics of a coherent state. But uh, <laughs> no, actually, what I was kind of getting at is this looks like an RY rotation in the block sphere. Right? So if you if you end up um, uh, taking a look at the evolution, we'll see that if we normalize the units of this harmonic oscillator properly, it, what ends up happening is that p squared plus q squared is equal to one. Right. So position and momentum up at the top can be, after being rescaled, actually re rewritten as the um, uh, as the components of a wave function whose norm is conserved under those dynamics, yes. Okay, so basically because each amplitude is a complex number, you have two degrees of freedom and you're having P1 and X, yeah. Yeah. but P, P and X in this case are not uh, independent. So is this what the- Oh, P and X are totally independent in this case. I mean, this, is, this was actually the hardest part of this project. The hardest part was constantly reminding ourselves that for the classical harmonic oscillator, P and Q commute. <laughs> it's really funny because I remember overzealous um, the physics uh, uh, props when I was doing my undergrad telling me that the real weirdness of quantum mechanics was that X and P don't commute. But after spending so long doing quantum mechanics, now it's almost impossible to think about the case where they do commute. <laughs> so in this setting, yeah, our X and P are independent uh, uh, variables. And if we encode them as part of a larger state vector, the concert, conservation of energy ends up implying that we have conservation of state vector norm, i.e. that's what leads directly to unitary dynamics. Okay, so now what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to be able to find a series of coordinate transformations that we can carry out that end up making this observation manifest. So we can end up seeing the dynamics of an ordinary harmonic oscillator within this encoding as a unitary uh, evolution. Then once we've drawn it as unitary evolution, we use Hamiltonian simulation methods to translate it forward to a quantum algorithm. Okay, so that's basically it. The encoding that we end up using is the following. We use this kind of weird redundant encoding. 
And the reason why we do it is for the exact same reason as was mentioned before. What we want to do is we want to use energy conservation over here, which is a quadratic Hamiltonian. And by the way, this would not, this does not work for even the slightest deviation from a quadratic Hamiltonian, because we need the sum of the squares of the wave function to equal one. So if we change any of those powers, this whole idea would not work. But what we do here is we then encode each of these quadratic degrees of freedom as a component in our vector over here. And you'll know one of the things that's weird about this representation is we have far more positions in this representation than we have momentum. Momenta. We here, if we have two to the n positions, we'll have a, a order two to the two n, or sorry, two to the if we have two to the n momenta, then we'll have order two to the two n positions because this representation stores the difference between every possible pair between it. Okay, so that is the kind of funky uh, code that we're using to represent this as a state vector. Then once we've got this, we need uh, it's not sufficient just to show that the norm is preserved because there's actually all sorts of non-unitary dynamics that the system could be seeing that happen to also preserve the norm. So what we'd like to be able to do now is go through a set of coordinate transformations to show that also the differential equation actually is unitary when we uh, work in a slight modification of this encoding. So what we do over here is, uh, first off, we write it in, the, in this form. Then once we've done that transformation to write X in this form that has the momenta and the position down here, our differential equation can be rewritten as a following second order system, where M is, a, in our case, a diagonal matrix of masses, and F is like our force matrix that ends up describing these particular coefficients that we get. Then what we're going to do in order, in order to help this along the way is uh, we're going to now come up with a new variable Y. Uh, which is the square root of the mass matrix times X. And um, once we end up doing this, we we'll also will find it's useful to, uh, to uh, define this A quantity, which is the square root of M inverse times F square root M. Once we end up doing this, just substituting it back in, we end up seeing that Y double dot is equal to uh, A Y. And so what we can do once we have it in, um, in this form is we can also note that any uh, linear combination of the previous uh, equations is equal to a solution to this. So we can end up using this fact in order to be able to show that the differential equation ends up implying this, because basically what we've done to this differential equation is we just added this term on both sides of it. Apart from that, it's exactly equal to the previous. But you'll note that by adding this to both sides, we can see that now this is a short, this is a Schrodinger equation, just in terms of the variable um, now uh, i square root a, and now our uh, our solution vector over here can be thought of as y dot plus i square root a y. So if we pick this now is our kind of refined encoding that we we had from the original one. Now, the dynamics of the harmonic oscillator in this is unitary, but what we're doing is we're kind of need to evolve using the square root of this matrix A over here, which describes the couplings in our system. So this, these are the algebraic steps that we use in order to be able to uh, rewrite the uh, uh, equation of motion for the classical harmonic oscillator as a Schrodinger equation. Now that we've, uh, we've done this, uh, if we take a look at the case of um, positive couplings, which uh, is kind of nice, then the square root becomes a lot easier because the square root, of course, you know, is the square root of a matrix. If we had negative eigenvalues, then things would get really funky with that. So we're going to take another step further and say we're not. We're going to require something stronger than no negative eigenvalues. We're going to require that none of the entries in it are negative at all. So all of the springs are attractive. There's no repulsive springs anywhere in the, the model. In that case, we can actually end up finding a nice uh, form for the inverse of this. The, the inverse uh, over here, or sorry, the, what we can do is if we want to figure out the square root of A, that's not a unique matrix. We can, there are many rectangular matrices that we could use to end up defining it. 
So what we do in order to find one that's computationally easy uh, to compute the matrix square root of this thing is we pick this B operator over here, where B is defined to be this following matrix when renormalized by the mat diagonal mass, which will give us the square root of the particular coupling between these two, um, and this over here for the off diagonal terms here. And so the basic idea behind this is that the coupling that we, we end up seeing over, um, over here, um, yeah, okay. This matrix, when we B, when we multiply it by uh, its adjoint, we will end up seeing that we end up getting this A matrix that was needed for the differential equation. So this B over here, even though it doesn't really look like it, for the case of purely positive couplings, you can see acts as A square root of A. So that's the square root that we choose. Um, we could choose others, but this one's more computationally really convenient. And so let me drag this off to the side. The um, right. So that is how this, this ends up going. Now that we've ended up uh, uh, doing this, what we can um, we can do is we can ask how do we end up implementing this in a quantum computer? So how do we build this effective Hamiltonian that we're evolving over? Because if you recall, what we need to, needed to do is we needed to apply this unitary over here, e to the i t square root a, which in our case will end up going to this e to the i t b. Because our B matrix, that I, the one that I just described, is our uh, square root of A. So we need to end up building this. So what we do is we figure out a way of embedding this, uh, uh, this uh, rectangular matrix as a subblock of a larger unitary matrix. And we can do that using log squared 1 over uh, epsilon cost. And the reason why it's log squared 1 over epsilon is because we need to do multiplication in order to be able to uh, construct this. And naive multiplication goes quadratically in a number of bits that we do. We use something like Karatsuba multiplication. Yes, we know we could do a little bit better, but eh, who cares? It's just a polylog factor. So the basic idea then, when we put this, this all together, we could do the block encoding and then take this a effective Hamiltonian that is used, uh, that the block encoding ends up yield, uh, yielding, and throw that into our quantum simulation algorithm in order to be able to do this. What we end up getting in the end is we end up getting the following scaling out of it. We uh, see that we can end up uh, performing uh, a simulation using a number of queries that ends up scaling uh, basically like linear in uh, um, in time and a polylogarithmically in one over epsilon. Um, one of the things that's actually interesting, if there's any specialists in the room, is that our algorithm actually happens to scale like the square root of the sparsity of the coupling matrix that we're taking a look at D, which came as a really big surprise because of the fact that if we look at general purpose Hamiltonian simulation, linear scaling with D is, is a lower bound. But that ends up saying, actually, these harmonic oscillators are not a generic example because there exists an algorithm here that can beat the linear uh, scaling lower bound with the sparsity. So this shows, high level, that there exists a quantum algorithm that can uh, end up simulating harmonic oscillators in polynomial time. But as I said before, there's been a long history of disappointments. Uh, involving this, where people have come up with quantum algorithms that they thought had an exponential advantage, but some smart computer scientist has figured out a randomized algorithm for doing basically the exact same thing in polynomially equivalent time on a classical computer. So how are we confident that this scaling down at the bottom is actually something that a classical computer is really unlikely to be able to tie? And that ends up coming in through the uh, BQP completeness uh, argument. So the way that we do this is we uh, go forward and we show how we can end up building an arbitrary quantum computer out of just a series set of harmonic oscillators. By the way, I, I really, we're, we're, my colleagues and I are really trying to get Google to shell out money to actually pay for a machinist 
to build a quantum computer out of a set of uh, honest to God real harmonic oscillators. Sadly, I think with all the firings at Google right now, maybe it might be a little bit hard to convince them to give the money, but I definitely think that would be a good use of Google's money to go and build like a four qubit quantum computer out of a set of uh, masses and springs. Uh, definitely, it's the sort of thing that I would want up in the walls of my physics department if I, uh, if I had a choice. But in any case, the way that we do this is we pick a universal gate set that we like. The universal gate set that we pick is Hadamard and Toffoli. By the way, Hadamard and Toffoli is my absolute favorite universal gate set. And it's a nerdy thing when you've got an absolute favorite universal gate set. But the reason why I love it is Toffoli is universal for classical computing. And if you just throw Hadamard on top of it, it becomes universal for quantum computing. And it's also fascinating because it's universal despite the fact that there's no imaginary numbers in it at all. So that uh, both of those things make this a super cool gate set. But one of the problems is that if you recall, the gates that we end up having, our Hadamard gate is described as a matrix that looks like this. Toffoli, of course, looks like one, zero, one, zero here. This is Toff, and this is equal to H which unfortunately has the same symbol as a Hamiltonian. Now, there's a problem with this, because if we wanted to implement this using our simulation method, I mentioned that we can't deal with couplings that are negative. So if I took this over here and tried to build it in a harmonic oscillator setting, that minus one in the bottom right corner would require us to have a repulsive interaction between the two. So the question is, how can we kind of uh, end up dealing with this in a uh, straightforward way? And by the way, the measurement that I should mention that we end up doing, because we need to talk about a concrete measurement. The measurement that we do for a universality construction is we look at the harmonic oscill uh, the e kinetic energy of a subset of the harmonic oscillators. And we use that in order to be able to encode what our, our value. All right. So the way that we end up doing this is using a construction that uh, Kidayev and Feynman uh, ended up coming up with, known as the clock Hamiltonian. And what this ends up being is it's a particular Hamiltonian that you can construct for any quantum circuit such that the natural evolution of that Hamiltonian will implement the sequence of gates that you want on your quantum computer. And the Hamiltonian that we, we would like to build ends up corresponding in our harmonic oscillator language to something, to a, a, an operator A that's of this form, where these WLs over here correspond to the gates that we want to do. So these are going to be either Hadamard or they're going to be Toffoli over here. And so then all we need to do is just decompose those matrices into smaller sub-matrices so we can convert this over into something that's a harmonic oscillator. The only problem is the term uh, that we end up getting that will be of the form uh, L, L plus one, which you can kind of view as like a hopping term if um, you prefer. And then we would have the one, one tensor over here and negative from this component when we do the decomposition of WL. So that corresponds again to a negative coupling that we would end up seeing uh, within our encoding. So we need to figure out a way of building a negative coupling inside our encoding without screwing up anything. Okay. And this requires some strategy to be able to deal with negativity. Um, the way that we end up doing this is actually, I, I think it's kind of a cool trick, but the way that we end up doing this is we throw in an extra ancillary qubit into our problem. And we put that qubit in, in the minus state uh, uh, over here. And the way, reason why we do that is we can consider now dilating our Hadamard over a larger space into the following block matrix. Let's say that I have a block matrix that's one over root two, identity, 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 and X over here. Now, if I act with this in block language, on a state that's of the form zero minus over here, we'll see that the identities don't do anything to the minus, but the x will get a minus sign kicked in. 
So this matrix over here, when we start with the resource state off to the side, will end up at producing the negative signs, but not actually have a Hamiltonian that has negative couplings. So that gives us a hack that we can use to sidestep around this uh, restriction by effectively using a um, extra qubit that's prepared you know, in a minus one eigenvector uh, of a partic our particular submatrix to end up implementing the negative couplings, even though they're all positive. Okay, so that's it. We carry this out, and then this, the natural dynamics of this Hamiltonian can be used in order to implement any sequence of Hadamard and Toffoli gates, which in turn is universal, meaning <laughs> this can implement any quantum computation. Now, in the event that there was a classical algorithm that we could use that's randomized or anything to be able to simulate this, then all of quantum mechanics, uh, to the best of our knowledge, uh, okay, except for potentially infinite dimensional systems, can be simulated in polynomial time by a uh, classical device, which we don't believe is true whatsoever. So the modulo, that complexity theoretic assumption, no classical algorithm can simulate uh, our, uh, our, our algorithm without an exponential slowdown. Okay. Also, we one of the things I should mention is that we also yell, uh, show an explicit query advantage for this. And the way that we show our query advantage is by taking a look at the celebrated problem of uh, traversing a set of blue trees using a continuous time quantum walk. The basic idea behind it is that if you were a walker moving through this, imagine you started an entrance and you want to find the exit, but you don't know where the, the label of the exit node is and you can only see your neighbors inside this maze. If you're a walker, just going through this maze, you'll keep on making progress going through each of these waves until you hit the middle. Now, once you hit the middle and have crossed over to the other side, now you're going to have a 50% chance of probability of going forward and a 50% chance of going back. And you can end up seeing that this random walk that you would end up getting on this side will take an exponentially large number of steps over here before you get n successes, which is what would be needed in order for you to be able to go to the other end. So in this case, though, if we take a look at the quantum walk, it turns out the quantum version of this actually ends up being diagonalizable in the column space of this vector, meaning that the, vec that the eigenvectors of the dynamics over here end up being supported on each of the individual columns like this over here. So instead of our problem looking like this, the quantum system, it actually just sees a 1D evolution on a line with absolutely nothing to get lost in. So it's, it takes time or a number of queries that is our order n to get to the other side. It just flies right through because of this uh, property that it happens to, uh, the quantum model happens to be diagonal in the column basis. So it doesn't see this confusing structure of the, the maze. And so it, this shows an exp provably exponential separation between quantum and classical and query complexity. And we can build this uh, exactly using harmonic oscillators by just putting springs in between a bunch of masses like that. So we can build also a set of interacting masses and springs that emulate this and prove that uh, we can get also not just a uh, separation in time uh, relative to complexity theoretic assumptions, but we can get an unconditional separation in query complexity between quantum and classical using this, which again, reinforces our beliefs that this is a fundamental uh, difference in the computational power. Of, uh, of our algorithm versus the best that you can do classically. So uh, that is exactly what I intended to say. So let's skip all of that because I'm basically at the end of this. So to conclude, what we've done is we've shown that actually there does exist a really surprising problem that we see in our the everyday world, which is masses and springs coupled with each other, secretly 
these systems are actually hiding mathematically equivalent structures to quantum mechanics. And further, they're computationally equivalent to quantum mechanical systems, albeit with far fewer qubits than the number of oscillators that you end up seeing in here. But there exists a mathematical isomorphism uh, between the two. We can exploit this in order to be able to build quantum algorithms to be able to simulate ordinary harmonic oscillators exponentially faster than what we can do with uh, classical. And this is based on arguments from, where, um, from complexity theory, meaning it conditioned on the belief that classical computers cannot simulate in polynomial time quantum effects in general, then we uh, end up getting an advantage. And also we get through this glue trees problem an exponential separation in a query complexity. But there's a number of things that are kind of left open by this because the way that this all ended up working or the high level idea going into it is that conservation of energy over here was, mat uh, was used in order to be able to kind of be equivalent with this quadratic Hamiltonian to conservation of the length of unit vectors. This part was, this observation is absolutely necessary in order to be able to uh, uh, get our technique to work. And that depended on our Hamiltonian being quadratic and also ended up depending on energy conservation. So the question is going forward, well, what other examples can we find? Is it true that these that the, this place is a fundamental barrier or only a barrier to our uh, our imagination? Maybe there do exist ways we can do work with transform coordinates to be able to deal with dissipation. Maybe there's ways that we can deal with uh, AI external coupling uh, through time dependent Hamiltonians. And maybe there's even ways that we could consider going beyond the linear case into the nonlinear case. But at the moment, the structure of the problem seems so specifically tailored to harmonic oscillators. It's very tempting to feel that there's kind of something fundamental about this map back and forth. But that said, there may we, it, this may just be a gap in our, uh, in our ingenuity. But to me, one of the biggest questions that still uh, emerges, unfortunately, it's one of the same questions that sparked the study in the first place which is we've proven there's a separation between the two, but what we haven't proven is that there's a classical, uh, there's a, actually an important example of masses and springs that are coupled together that we can provide an advantage for. What I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to say that this is an algorithm that we can do in order to be able to say, you know, assess the stability of a bridge or, you know, um, to be able to simulate the, uh, the dynamics of an aircraft near equilibrium. Things like that I'd like to be able to do, but we haven't been able to show conclusively that we can map all of the information that specifies those problems efficiently over to the quantum computer in a way that you know um, it doesn't include exponential overheads. So from that perspective, it's still an open question about whether or not this actually leads to a practical um, advantage for problems in mechanical engineering. But my hope is that with continued thought, we'll be able to understand a lot better the relationship between um, mechanical oscillations and uh, quantum dynamics, as well as understand well what the practical limit opportunities that quantum computers are going to have for uh, science and society. Thank you very much. Okay, questions. Thanks for that interesting talk. Uh, one question. So basically what you're simulating is kind of the probability amplitudes of the quantum vector. Yeah. So if you put that into quantum computer, uh, reconstructing that output state is so measurement is not very easy. So yeah. is that why you measure kind of subset that uh, like energies or subsets yeah. of the exactly. kind of observable that's actually quantum? Yeah, because those are coarse grained observables that we can then yeah, estimate. With, uh, with an additive error and still meaningfully extract information out. And specifically for these, both of these problems over here, the, um, the clock state Hamiltonian and the glued trees problems, 
is exactly problems of that character where the kinetic energy of one of the oscillators that we end up getting will be quite high in the end for uh, for both cases that we're interested in. Okay. So, so maybe you, you said the answer, but uh, I'm, just, I'm just gonna replace what I understand. Yeah. So right. If I have a classical harmonic oscillator to simulate a classical harmonic oscillator, are you claiming that this is lower than using a quantum computer? Okay, so let's let me uh, take a take a step back here, right? So first off, you know, if we're capable of building an exponentially large system of coupled mm -hmm. harmonic oscillators with their couplings precisely chosen in order to be able to implement this, then I could build a classical harmonic <laughs> oscillator to emulate a quantum computer to simulate a classical harmonic oscillator. You're absolutely correct, and I would get I'd be able to do that very quickly. But I'd have to build an exponentially large number of masses of springs in order to be able to simulate that smaller system in the first place. So the, the real question when you're thinking about kind of like the power of these analog systems is that in general, we actually believe that analog systems are more powerful than, than quantum computers even. Because if you don't place restrictions on your ability to tune each of those individual parameters and measure a finite number of bits of precision of all of the outputs, it turns out there's ways you can embed NP-hard problems in the infinite number of bits needed to specify the positions going in. So we need to be kind of careful here. If we start talking now about you know, um, putting finite numbers of bits of precision for all of these things, then we start running into issues about machining. And uh, uh, there, the big advantage that quantum ends up providing is that we can use quantum error correction to be able to actually get around some of these, these things. So ultimately, actually, the thing that really gives us our advantage and makes this practical for quantum, but not practical for building an analog device for implementing a quantum computer, apart from the exponentially large amount of mass that you would need, is the fact that we can use error correction to be able to get around imprecisions in machinery with quantum, but we can't do that with classical. How, how deeply have people thought about classical error correction and these kinds of systems you're discussing? Uh, not that deeply. Uh, the big problem, though, that ends up coming into it is certainly with the way that if we did a naive encoding, like just taking the position and momentum and mapping those like position and momentum of physical things. The problem is, is that in theory, every single possible displacement that you can end up getting is now a valid code word for our error correcting code. We need to have some distance between the, uh, the individual code words to be able to tell the difference between an error and uh, the correct dynamics for the system. And so that's one of the reasons why the possibility theorems have been shown for a generic continuous evolution like this. But we could embed um, discrete degrees of freedom inside harmonic oscillators and do stuff with that. So the problem about like in general, you know, uh, doing, doing this with infinite amount of uh, precision is totally impossible. But figuring out smarter ways in order to be able to embed discrete problems here, yeah, I don't think there's been that, that much thought on that. And there could potentially be more. You had a question? Yeah, so you keep talking about the issues of mass and uh, sort of designing mechanical systems, but uh, electromagnetic field is also a bunch of sure. possible. Yeah. So why not use light? Cavities? Yeah, yeah. That's something. That's something. Unfortunately, that you know came to our you know that we realized when we started talking about actually building these things is that we we could probably build it with an LC circuit way better than we would with a machine, but. Let's be honest, the springs are cooler. But that said, the um, the well, the mass issue would probably be a lot better for the uh, cost of building the field. Um, the thing is that the precise tuning of all of the capacitances and, uh, and inductances that you would end up needing in order to implement this over here that faces the exact same issue that I was talking about with requiring air correction. Those things would all have to be tuned within an exponentially fine uh, window. And I don't know any way to actually be able, with uh, any existing classical strategy, to be able to build that level of redundancy physically into an LC circuit either, or get it directly into an electromagnetic field. I was also curious, can you map 
uh, this analysis onto something like boson assembly to, to understand where the complexity comes from there? That's a very interesting question. So boson sampling, though, it's funny because that is sort of like the quantum analog of what we're taking a look at, because really that's like a quantum harmonic oscillator rather than classical. We did spend some time talking about whether or not we could think of like a um, uh, an analog of boson sampling for these exponentially large systems of harmonic oscillators, but we couldn't find one immediately. But that doesn't necessarily mean that one doesn't exist. There could be an analogous boson sampling result for uh, the dynamics of these uh, uh, harmonic oscillator systems. I think it's a good question. No further question. Thank you for our speaker again.